we're going to continue now with presentations on clinical studies and emerging therapeutic approaches addressing long COVID. Uh, I'll note that there will not be a Q&A following these presentations, but panelists and audience members, please feel free to engage using the Q&A function. Uh, first up, we have, uh, we will hear from uh, Dr. Walter uh, Kovachetz, Director of the National Institute of Neur Neurological Disorders and Stroke. He's co-leading the Recover Initiative, which is a major NIH study of long COVID. Uh, so Dr. Kovachetz, take it away, please. Oh, thanks very much, Carter. And uh, yeah, this was an uh, amazing uh, workshop so far. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the things that the Recover Initiative, which is a major initiative to try and get at the bottom of uh, long COVID, uh, has been doing. And, and, and hopefully you'll see how it can intersect with a lot of people, a lot of what other folks have already presented. OK, next slide. Yeah, <clears throat> next slide. So the Recover Initiative is a large program. It was authorized by Congress, appropriated $1.15 billion to run over four years. And uh, I'm going to give a brief overview, talk a, bit, a little bit about the coming progress and the upcoming activities. Next slide. So don't have to go through this. Uh, I think the take home point is that, as was mentioned, the uh, things that people are suffering from uh, are heterogeneous. Um, they do have, have, however, happen to cluster in groups. And so getting at those clusters is going to be important, uh, particularly if you want to try and help folks because you want a treatment that's going to be focused on the problems that they're having. Um, and as, as we heard, a lot of different systems affected from the GI tract to the small fiber nerves that Senator Kane talked about, his problem um, to uh, you know, to damage that's been done either to the pancreas or the kidney during the acute infection. And also, you know, not to, not to be minimized, but, you know, COVID is a tremendous uh, stressor to the entire country and to the individuals who had COVID and their families who had COVID, some of whom died. And, you know, you have COVID and you're not getting better. That is a, that, that is a tough pill to swallow. And so, there's normal reaction to all of, the, all of these things uh, happening to you, uh, particularly when there's so much ambiguity about what's going on and how long it's going to last. Next slide. Uh, so the, the Recover Initiative, you know, it's, it's got many components to it, but to simplify it, it's just got these four basic missions. One is to try and understand what is the biology underlying the the, the, the symptoms that people are uh, suffering with uh, months after their acute infection. And as was mentioned, this is not really a new problem. It's something that we've been struggling with. I know uh, Salva me with us on, on how, to, how to understand what's happening. People who have myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, and so in putting this together, having had experience in that space, uh, it, it seemed to me that this was going to be a really hard problem. If it wasn't going to be hard, someone was going to figure it out and, and we wouldn't be having this symposium now. Um, but now we're years into it. And so the recovery was kind of put together as a really, you know, really massive project, not to leave any stone unturned, but to set up for the long term. Um, and, and, and so that's, that's exactly what we're doing. We're trying to define the risk factors, the incidence and prevalence, um, the different subtypes, subphenotypes. The purpose of the, that is, again, to identify interventions that are going to help people with these different subphenotypes. But if we can get at the underlying biology, we could potentially, you know, I guess it was poo-pooed a little bit about that there's not going to be a magic bullet. But I still have hope that we can identify some of the things that Dr. Iwasaki was talking about that might underlie all of the symptoms and, and we end up with a treatment that could melt away um, a majority of these symptoms, at least in a significant proportion of people. Um, okay, and, and so we, we've, we've really paid attention to make this patient-centered and we have patients and people with lived experience um, as part of you know, each of the steps. Um, it's a national scale. Um, in terms of the protocols, they're, they're very kind of um, standardized common data elements. Uh, for the clinical trials, we have platform uh, 
uh, clinical trial protocols have been put together where you can insert one intervention after another. The protocols are designed to either you know, get at the underlying biology or to get at the symptom complexes that we see. Uh, next slide. And we have to change. We don't, you know, we're going to find things and we got to change. Um, so as uh, Emma Levine mentioned, uh, that this is part of a bigger national action plan on long COVID on the part of the government. Uh, so we're just one piece of this, but many, many different agencies are involved and coordinated. And today, Admiral Levine has talking to our partners in, in the UK. Um, and so, uh, so this is a problem that is a global problem that the government's taken very seriously. Next slide. Um, so people talked about uh, the, the potential underlying biology seen here in the under these pathobiology so, uh, section. Um, so we're very interested in the, at the viral persistence question, whether there's reactivation of different viruses, whether there's immune dysregulation. Clearly we know COVID, the immune response in COVID turned out in many people to be fatal uh, so that really, it really went over the top. And, and so is that still going on in some people, immune dysregulation? Um, we have actually autopsy studies as part of COVID to try to look inside the, the, uh, the tissues under the microscope to see if we can see any signs of, the, of pathology, whether it's, you know, abnormal T cells or B cells uh, in, in immune tissues or aggravated microglia in the brain. All these kind of things you can kind of get a guess at from a non-invasive study, but there's this is really the gold standard. So we think that the tissue is really uh, going to be important. Um, we have spent a lot of time on enrolling uh, clinical cohorts. So we have what I think is the largest in-person study of of uh, long COVID in the world. Um, uh, we also have electronic health record cohorts groups that had already had access to 60 million health records. And then we have community-based cohorts of studies that were going on at NIH and they were kind of pivoted to look at long COVID. We're very interested and in just starting now to kind of get into the clinical trial business. We have solicited trial ideas from across the country. We work with companies on, on some of their assets, whether drugs, biologic devices, behavioral treatments, uh, integrative medicine, uh, all these kind of things may have have a role in certain types of people or uh, certain clusters of people in long COVID. Um, and importantly to mention that we are setting up a data resource core that's you know forever that people will be able to mine this data. We don't get the quick answers now. The data will be there along with the samples for people to examine over time and uh, uh, Ovid certainly knows the value of that for MECFS to have these kind of really great samples stored uh, with good clinical data. Um, next slide. <clears throat> so I'll just talk about the electronic health record study. So far, they're the ones who have kind of come out with the, the publications the fastest because these things can be done very quickly. Next slide. Um, and uh, so, as I said, 60 million records. 7 million COVID cases through these uh, things that were set up at NIH ahead of time for other purposes uh, and, and also for CORNET, uh, the Patient Centered Outcome Research Center out of Duke. Um, and so they have you know, had publications now on developing computable phenotypes for PASC in adults and children, uh, de determined that pre-COVID vaccination reduces the risk. They picked up what they think is a 4% prevalence of PASC in children, uh, identified adult risk factors for long COVID. These are the kind of things that have been talked about, severity, comorbidities, female sex, racial and ethnic uh, uh, backgrounds, uh, developed uh, pediatric risk factors, and, um, and also increased risk of some new onset conditions in past patients, particularly type 2 diabetes, anxiety disorder, ataxia, and uh, uh, muscle, muscle peripheral nerve disorders uh, where Senator Keynes would probably fall. Next slide. Uh, we have the chance that we can actually uh, have this cohort study of, of people in person that we can match up their electronic health records to get a really much more refined uh, electronic health record signature. Uh, 
Um, the preliminary findings are that the higher peaks of pass were earlier in the pandemic uh, when we had the more severe acute illness. So all along, severity of illness goes with risk of pass. However, we don't see much difference in the makeup of the symptoms, whether people had um, Delta or Omicron. Um, so, the, so although your risk of getting PASC is lower, it's not clear that PASC is any different if you get it, what, whether you get it from Omicron or Delta. It's still to be worked out, but that's kind of what it looks like so far. Vaccination decreases a patient's predicted probability of PASC. Um, and uh, protects against some of the cardiac complications. Um, as I mentioned, the symptoms seem to be fairly consistent across the infection waves. Um, the, the rates are lower in the later years, probably Omicron came in and vaccination doesn't prevent it, but it, it definitely decreases your risk of developing the post-acute sequelae COVID, which in this case is really long COVID uh, as we, as we're defining it now. Uh, we use the word post-acute sequelae of COVID because we think that this study goes on for years to try and determine what was the effect of the COVID epidemic on the national health. So is there more risk of heart attack or stroke or lower risk, hopefully, uh, but, uh, but, but it encompasses all those kind of downstream effects of the acute infection. Well, on COVID, of course, is the one we're most concerned with now. Next slide. But the electronic health record studies are set up for a long time. So in terms of the in-person enrollments, um, we have enrolled a, over 11,000 adults, uh, for an additional 1,400 pregnant adults, and uh, 2.6 uh, 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 yeah, 2,696 uh, pediatrics uh, in-person enrollment, and we have you know standardized questionnaires, standardized testing. Everybody gets, it's called tier one, and depending on the symptoms, they'll get it more in-depth studies in the tier two. And then for, for you know, really in-depth analysis, there are some of the more invasive studies or go into tier three, and patients move in those tiers depending on their symptoms. Next slide. Uh, what they've done so far, and this is just what we just heard about, it's not published yet, um, but they did kind of a, you know, a machine learning type of look at the, uh, the different symptoms that the patients uh, 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 manifested uh, in the 16,000 adult and pediatric patients. And they were able with cluster analysis, see there were certain clusters. Um, and, uh, and again, these fit in uh, significantly with what's been described before in terms of clusters, but this has you know real statistical uh, basis behind it. Um, and uh, I would say, you know, looking at uh, the co the uh, correlate with uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, post-exertional uh, uh, malaise was was really one of the signatures of of, of two of these uh, uh, groupings. And, and if people don't know, that is a somewhat of a unique signature of MECFS where people who have a good day, they you know, go out to the store, come home, and the next two days they are completely wiped out. Um, so a very kind of unique feature of MECFS, which we are seeing significant numbers. I'd say also possible static tachycardia syndrome is, uh, can, can be quite severe and, and very common in these groups. Um, and uh, in our acute cases, so we are enrolling people, not just people who have passed from an infection two to three months ago, but we're trying to enroll about 5,000 people who are acutely infected so we can follow them over time uh, to see what's the difference between somebody who's acutely infected and makes a good response versus somebody who's acutely infected and, and develops long-term trouble. Um, now you enroll in that study up to a month after your acute infection. So I think we do have a bias of, which is a good thing, of people coming in uh, with uh, symptoms that are persistent. Um, so in our study so far, about 20 to 30% of the people who enroll in the acute cohort have uh, what we call long COVID at three months after enrollment, which gives us a good chance of seeing um, what what's the difference in those uh, recovery 
biology, but probably not a good uh, indication of prevalence or, or, or yeah, incidence. Next slide. Um, we also have uh, NIH studies, as I mentioned before, that have previously been set up and now be contributed to looking at long COVID. One of them is the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study, which is 12,000 adolescents already enrolled, uh, looking at brain development, social development, drug use over time, and now it can look at uh, the effect of COVID in this group. Uh, just an example, but multiple others. Next slide. The etiologies, uh, people have already talked about these. Um, and uh, so I don't think I'm going to go through them again. It's just to say that there are, as, as mentioned, a couple of publications that are hinting at some of these things. Uh, well, actually, they're hinting at all of those things. So one question that Recover can do is to try to you know, take some of these findings and then see if, you, if they stick when you validate them at large, larger numbers. And, so you mentioned the Walt study, and uh, so we worked with David Walt, and uh, it didn't work out as we had hoped, and so we're now back to the drawing board with David, but, uh, but that's the advantage of, of a multi-center study such as this. Next slide. Uh, and just a couple of things that, that kind of intrigue me. Um, so we talked about David Walt's study, looking at uh, spike antigens circulating people with PASC. There's a different study against small, and again, you'd need to replicate it, but this is looking at exosomes. So these are lipid particles that are released from tissues. And um, what they find is R both RNA and protein um, in these exosomes in people with PASC, uh, much more so than people who are negative for PASC. And, and again, um, I think David was also thinking that his spike was, was attached to exosome, but this is more specific uh, where you isolate the exosomes first and then look at, uh, at the uh, antigens or RNA attached to these exosomes. So this might be a way of moving towards a diagnostic test. Um, the next slide. And um, the next slide, right. So this was mentioned as well. This is an NIH study on autopsies claiming that the SARS-CoV-2, either RNA or uh, antigen, is present at multiple anatomic sites up to 230 days after symptom onset. Uh, very little inflammation or very little viral cytopathology outside the lung. So these findings are not associated with you know, death of the tissue or inflammation. Um, so it's somehow hiding under that immune response. Um, but clearly, it could be triggering the immune response that uh, Dr. Iwasaka talked about. Um, now, one question is, is this, is this uh, you know, replication competent virus? That clearly then you would want an antiviral agent. Or is this um, remnants of previous infection where the particles are now in all your different tissues and are slowly going to be released over time and continue to uh, uh, stimulate your immune system. Um, and maybe this happens in everybody after COVID and some people are more vulnerable to develop the immune response that causes their symptom, or perhaps it's more specific and that's the kind of things we have to figure out. And that's gonna really define what kind of therapies, the biologic therapies you're gonna go after. Next slide. Uh, and next slide, so the clinical trials we've done for the clinical trials is uh, set up uh, master protocols, next slide, uh, for uh, the, different, the different major areas. So these are the four major symptomatic areas. We have different protocols for each of these. And then for the viral persistence and immune dysregulation, these are underlying biology questions that a therapy would potentially affect multiple different uh, symptoms that a patient has. And so it's more of a conglomeration of these four yellow ones uh, into uh, these kind of studies that would get, so we're currently working uh, uh, to try to develop the antiviral uh, uh, study. Next slide, this is it. So we went through the, the key progress, a lot of people working and my gosh, hats off to the people who enrolled in this study, thousands of people who most of them do it for pure altruism. Um, and, uh, and I think this is, uh, I think our best chance of uh, 
kind of validating with a lot of the people you heard uh, talking about today. So thanks very much for your attention and happy to answer questions in the chat. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cortez. And I will note that I think there's some really good questions in the Q and A. So um, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep the summit on schedule. But if you would if you would mind, we'd really be grateful if you could uh, engage with some of those questions via the Q and A uh, box. That would be great. Uh, and we look forward. Um, I think I speak on behalf of all of us. We look forward to uh, receiving the continued learnings through this very important work. So again, thank you and thank your entire teams uh, for all that they're doing. Okay. Uh, the thank next, you, four, thank you, thank you. Uh, the next four presentations are from companies that have clinical studies uh, that are about to start or are already enrolling patient uh, patients and or employing different uh, therapeutic approaches to long COVID. Uh, first up, I'd like to welcome Tom Equals, uh, the CEO of AIM Immunotech. Uh, Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and on behalf of our team at AIM Immunotech, thank you for your interest. You can go to the next slide, please. AIM Immunotech, and, and this is with regard to uh, post-COVID chronic fatigue-like conditions, has an experimental drug, Amplogen, also known as Rintatolamod, uh, which uh, we've demonstrated uh, in the past to have not only an extremely well-developed safety profile, uh, where the drug is generally well tolerated without significant adverse events uh, in chronic fatigue syndrome, but also uh, indicators of efficacy and, and strong response in early onset chronic fatigue syndrome and in a recent pilot study uh, with regard to post-COVID chronic fatigue-like conditions. Now, before we move into that, I wanna talk about something that, that's been addressed here in terms of priorities and, and uh, tension. And, and I'd, I'd like to address this in a, in a way that helps us to understand what we need to do going forward. You see in the disease areas on this slide, we talk about immuno-oncology. Well, I repurposed Amplogen into oncology in late 2016. And this was based upon certain preclinical work that we had done that indicated that amplogen might serve to uh, create a very positive immune response related to tumors, uh, not just individually as a single agent, but also in conjunction with checkpoint blockade therapies. Now, now that work uh, uh, moved forward extremely rapidly from 2016 we've uh, been able to obtain, and this is fully supported with funding from industry. Uh, for example, we have a major uh, phase two uh, advanced recurrent ovarian cancer study going on at the University of Pittsburgh uh, that's funded by a Merck grant. We have numerous studies in stage four triple negative breast cancer uh, and pancreatic cancer that are funded by governmental uh, uh, resources. And if you look at what was published in oncology last year, there are numerous publications uh, uh, with very significant independent analysis of data at major cancer research institutes related to amplogen in oncology. And that's only with a pro program that was started in 2016. Now, why is that? The reason is that nobody questions the etiology of pancreatic cancer or advanced or current ovarian cancer. Nobody questions the need for a therapy. And nobody questions if you're having a positive therapeutic response that it's important given, uh, especially in these late stage diseases where we work, uh, the, the level of mortality. But when it comes to chronic fatigue syndrome, and uh, now we have post-COVID chronic fatigue-like conditions or long COVID, we have a different uh, situation because while tremendous progress has been made over the past three or four years, uh, what, what uh, we're still left with is not having a clear understanding of the disease, how it works, the various segments uh, that it applies to. And that results in a lack of sponsorship 
of important therapeutic research by industry and sometimes by government. Next slide, please. Now, our drug is a toll-like receptor three agonist. And as such, it uh, stimulates a significant innate immune system response, but without inflammation. And uh, it has a very strong antiviral, demonstrated antiviral and demonstrated anti-tumor effect. And it does so with over 100,000 IV doses having been administered uh, with an excellent safety profile. Next slide, please. Now, I'd like to point out the similarities between chronic fatigue syndrome and, and the segment of long COVID that relates to the chronic fatigue-like symptoms. Now, what we know when we look at this disease is the chronic fatigue syndrome is exhibiting uh, symptoms that are almost identical to this sector of long COVID. But what we also know, and, and, and this is uh, based on, and in, 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 because of the nature of it, anecdotal information, is that many of the people who had severe chronic fatigue syndrome reported, and now the reason it's anecdotal is because they're getting into chronic fatigue research late in the disease, some with more than 12 years uh, from the onset of symptoms, but many, many uh, of these people, uh, an overwhelmingly uh, strong majority, are reporting that their disease first commenced with an acute flu-like illness. Of course, with them, we don't know what that acute flu-like illness was. Was it a virus? Was it bacterial? We, we just have to accept that general statement. However, with the onset of COVID-19, we know that the precursor to these chronic fatigue-like conditions was an acute infection of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Next slide, please. Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, efficacy in chronic fatigue syndrome because our interest in, in uh, post-COVID chronic fatigue-like symptoms or conditions uh, is driven by our demonstrated efficacy, the high level of response in phase two and three trials in the disease known as chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, in a, a large phase three study, AMP 516, we were seeing a response rate of almost 40% in, uh, in chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, but we looked for subsets that uh, might have an even greater response. And one of the things we did is we put a lens on the, the data where we looked at the midpoint in terms of onset of disease. That midpoint was eight years. When we looked at, at those who uh, uh, responded from, uh, that had the onset of disease between two and eight years, the uh, efficacy or response rate jumped up to over 50%. Now, why is this important? Next slide, please. In post-COVID chronic fatigue-like conditions, we have an indicator that, that gave us a strong clue as to what was to come. You'll see at the bottom of this slide a reference to a, a, a JAMA article. Uh, and this is an article that discusses, and this was, I believe, uh, funded by NIH uh, grant. And uh, it, it discusses survivors of the original SARS virus, SARS-CoV-1. And in that study, it showed that people who had survived two years after infection, 27% meant the CDC guidelines for uh, US CDC guidelines for chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, we've done a, a, a pilot study in uh, chronic fatigue-like uh, conditions post COVID. And here we have uh, a chart which shows uh, of the four subjects in that pilot study, three had a very positive response and one had a marginal response. 
uh, but generally it is a very strong level of improvement in that pilot study. That was a part of AMP 511. Uh, now, next slide, please. The, uh, the result of this is we're moving forward with a clinical trial that has been authorized, the IND has been authorized uh, by the FDA. It's designated as AMP 518. Uh, we're doing uh, final uh, modifications of the protocol to make sure that the questionnaires measuring fatigue uh, will have the highest likelihood of meeting uh, the standards and requirements that, that uh, the FDA in particular and also the EMA would look for. Uh, and uh, we're going forward with that as rapidly as possible. Next slide, please. So this upcoming clinical trial is going to be a phase two trial with a lot of subjects. And it's, it's, uh, we believe it has the potential uh, to have significant uh, impact in demonstrating a therapeutic response. We're the only late stage drug showing efficacy in chronic fatigue syndrome. We've been approved in Argentina uh, for treatment of severe chronic fatigue syndrome. And we believe that our drug will, based upon the pilot study, have the potential to have the same therapeutic response demonstrated. But what I ask is, is that because we don't understand uh, long COVID completely shouldn't stop us from funding both through bi big, big pharma as well as government these types of clinical trials and giving it the full governmental support because we know, we know right now that in the United States alone, we're going to see tens of millions of cases of long COVID. And we also know from our experience with chronic fatigue syndrome, and I've inter interviewed many, many chronic fatigue sufferers, that it is not only a debilitating and often disabling disease, but it is a disease that has a lethal component because there are psychological and medical comorbidities, specifically uh, situational suicidal ideation. There, uh, People who have severe chronic fatigue syndrome after an extended period of time, the suicide rates are dramatically increased. And we can expect to see the same thing with long COVID. Furthermore, okay, those- yeah, I'm just gonna, yeah, if we could kind of wrap it up, I just wanna make, make right. sure fun schedule, one, thank you. One, la one last point. Furthermore, um, we also see high levels of cardiac uh, problems in people suffering from severe chronic fatigue syndrome. And we can expect that same impact in long COVID, which leads to a, a increased death. So with that, I wanna thank you very much for your interest in Amplogen and Rintotolamod and, and what we're doing in long COVID. And, and we ask that if you're in industry or in government and you can support these clinical efforts, we, we, we beg you to help us move forward as rapidly as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Equals. And I'll note again, there's some great questions in the q and If you have time to engage, uh, that would be most, Appreciate it. Thank you again very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we have, uh, we'll hear from Dr. Margaret Cosell, Chief Medical Officer at Excella Therapeutics. Uh, Dr. Cosell, the Zoom room is yours. And there's always one person who struggles with the button to get off of mute. Uh, that was me apparently today. I wanna to thank uh, BIO and the SOLVE MECFS consortium for pulling us all together to here. It's great to see that there are literally hundreds of people who are interested in this problem coming at it from all angles. And I'll note from my own personal experience in drug development and clinical care, that the more people who lean in and gather in and put energy behind a problem, the quicker we're gonna to get to the solutions here. And I wanna emphasize that it's a plural, it's gonna be multiple solutions. So I'm here on behalf of my colleagues at Excella Therapeutics to discuss one of our compositions, X1125, as a potential treatment for long COVID fatigue. We could go to the next slide, please. So Excella is a small company. We're based just outside of Boston. It was founded by flagship pioneering. And we have a big what if question is, what if we could treat complex diseases? In other words, those diseases in which multiple pathways are dysregulated. And I think we've heard some really elegant talks here earlier today 
about the multiple pathways that become dysregulated in long COVID. And this contrasts the more typical pharmaceutical approach, which takes a single target and then a single approach to that target and then tries to combine them. And that creates its own set of problems, namely when you combine medications, sometimes you have overlapping toxicities or side effects. Now our product candidates are amino acids. So as we're tackling these, com these complex diseases by design in combination, we're using amino acids and derivatives which have a long history of safety. We all ingest amino acids on a daily basis. Levels of amino acids in therapeutic levels, therapeutic pharmacologic level dosing have been used for years across a range of patient conditions ranging from the very young to the very old and in a range of medical conditions. So we have this combination by design using an approach that is inherently safe. So we've been able to combine these amino acids in different ways. We've tackled a number of diseases. We have clinical data through phase two in end-stage liver disease, that's something called hepatic encephalopathy, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or fatty liver, and long COVID now. And so what I'm here is to share with you today is what we have demonstrated to date using a phase two trial, that's an intermediate step in drug development, where we tested it in individuals with long COVID fatigue, and also to discuss our phase 2B3 trial design, which was recently approved by regulators in the United Kingdom and the US. So if we could go on to the next slide, please. So when we became interested in long COVID, which was about a year and a half ago, let me explain our rationale. We had been working with a amino acid composition, AXA 1125, and we had been using it in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and had been studying specifically for its ability to uh, serve as a mitochondrial activator and also control inflammation because both of those pathways are dysregulated in NASH. And so as the reports of long COVID started to emerge, we were struck by a couple things. One is, as you have heard from Dr. Levine and others, we know that viruses create disturbances, again, particularly in the mitochondrial pathway, particularly in control of inflammation. That is, if you think of it in teleologic terms, viruses are there, they are there to persist. And so what they try to do is alter the normal host response to viruses. So we have seen that with other infections. We saw emerging reports in the setting of long COVID that SARS-CoV-2 also did this. And we were also struck by the striking clinical and biologic similarities to ME-CFS. So we looked extensively into that literature because you always, as a medical researcher, you listen to what the patient is telling you. And the patient stories were very similar, both in terms of the fatigue element but also this particular element of post-exertional malaise as it's known in the literature. And so now both at the beginning of the studies and as we have continued to do our non-clinical and clinical research, what we've begun to do is demonstrate that we are, identify, or we are um, improving the three canonical pathways that we've outlined here. So namely, we were looking at mitochondrial metabolism and bioenergetics, and we have both preclinical and clinical evidence of this, both in the setting of long COVID and in NASH. We've also looked at measures of oxidative stress and the pro-inflammatory state that you've heard Dr. Iwasaki describe and have seen improvements in that again in both preclinical and, and clinical models, as well as looked at endothelial dysfunction, which hasn't been talked about as extensively here today, uh, but is certainly a component uh, we believe of this syndrome. And again, I wanna emphasize that what we're trying to do is address fatigue specifically, not necessarily all aspects of long COVID, but the fatigue, which we uh, again have heard earlier today is linked to the ability to function and to go back to work. So if we could go on to the next slide, please. So about a year and a half ago, we started a clinical trial at the University of Oxford. This was a randomized, blinded, placebo-controlled 28-day studies. And individuals, in order to enter the study, had to have severe fatigue for at least 12 weeks with no pre-existing reason for fatigue. 
And the study was initially designed really to um, characterize what we believe to be mitochondrial dysfunction and to look at the effects of AXA 1125 on mitochondrial dysfunction. We also included clinical measures of fatigue and function. And this particular study, we used a, a scoring instrument called the CFQ11 that was developed in the context for use in MECFS. And we also used a six minute walk at the time as a measure of physical function. And what we showed were highly statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvements in fatigue. And this particular scoring system that we use can measure both physical and mental components of fatigue. And we saw improvements in both of those. And particularly for the physical element of fatigue, we saw improvement in about 70% of subjects over the just four weeks of product administration. I'll show you that on the next slide. Um, what I also want to emphasize though, that in addition to improvements in the measures of fatigue, we also saw the beginnings of improvement in physical function. Again, this was just 28 days of study. And as we looked at people whose fatigue was improving, we also saw improvements in their ability to function, at least in this study, as measured by a six minute walk. Now we did learn that there was significant mitochondrial dysfunction at the start of the study. And again, as people's fatigue improved, we could see improvements in that mitochondrial function. Um, we, like I think others in the industry have faced the, um, the questions of, well, this isn't real. How do you know this is a real disease? What's your objective biomarker? So this is the kind of evidence along with the vast literature that's now accumulated that says, this is a real disease. You do not have this degree of mitochondrial dysfunction without something seriously going wrong with, with the biology at the heart of it. So I just wanna say to the patients out there, we have been listening to you, we believe you. There is real evidence here that we can point to that says that the underlying biology. We've also seen improvements in other biomarkers that again, correlate with improvements in the inflammatory state. And finally, and most importantly, it was very safe and well tolerated in this study. We have also dosed uh, AX 1125 to more than 200 people in doses ranging from a single dose to um, almost a year of product administration. And so uh, we have a, a good handle on the safety and tolerability of this. And then finally, I'll just show our phase three, three study design. If I could go to the next slide, please. Actually, one, go two more, please. So this is a potential pivotal trial. This study design has been approved in the United Kingdom and the US, as I said. This is a three-month study, placebo-controlled, designed to measure whether or not there are improvements in fatigue and physical function with just 12 weeks of product administration. Again, we'll have the uh, details of the study up on clinicaltrials.gov. I would echo Dr. Equal's uh, comments about uh, trying to get all of the stakeholders together here. We are presently looking for funding to start the study and complete the study. I, I, again, I will say to the patients out there, we hear you, we know that every day matters to you. Um, we know you're suffering and we are working as hard as we can to get the study up and running. It's not been easy. Um, Dr. Equals, I think will tell you, it's not easy being the first and the leading edge. Uh, which is the position that we're being in. So we would plead again with all the stakeholders in this call, help us in this effort. We believe it's important. We wanna give it a try. So help us help the patients. So thank you for your attention. And I'll look into the questions and try to answer those as we go. Thank you so much, Dr. Kozell. And I, I love the question you posed at the very beginning about how to treat complex diseases. So, but, so thank you for your presentation and thank you for your work. Uh, we will now hear from Dr. Bruce Patterson, CEO of Incel DX about how they are applying a diagnostic algorithm um, for, for treatment. Uh, Dr. Patterson. Great, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Bruce Patterson. I'm a viral pathologist and CEO of uh, Incel DX. What I'm gonna be talking about is the pathogenesis and treatment of chronic inflammatory conditions, including long COVID. Uh, our feeling is without understanding the pathogenesis, it was hard to come by uh, tr rational treatment strategies. But by the use of uh, precision diagnostics, uh, we were able to identify 
uh, obviously a major um, uh, cause of long COVID and be able to target that with specific therapeutics. Next slide. We all know the problem. Uh, what struck us was that of the 20 to 30 million people in the US who suffer from long COVID, the, num the numbers of MECFS went up almost in parallel. Um, and as um, Solve ME has put out, the cost of the US healthcare system is somewhere between 250 billion and $1 uh, trillion. Uh, we have over um, 36,000 enrollees in our program. So we have a tremendous database of not only long COVID, but MECFS, uh, Lyme, uh, fibromyalgia, um, and um, others. Next slide. Uh, we just launched the uh, first uh, long COVID diagnostic uh, in Europe in uh, September. It was approved by the um, regulatory bodies uh, in Europe following extensive validation. It's been validated by a number of different laboratories uh, in the United States. Uh, and we actually take the raw data generated look by looking at a panel of 14 cytokines and chemokines and apply very specific algorithms to not only define uh, who has long COVID, but to also differentiate it between MECFS, uh, post Lyme, and fibromyalgia, which I'll talk about in a minute, and is an absolute critical uh, distinction going forward uh, with clinical trials. Next slide. Our first paper on machine learning and AI came out um, almost uh, two and a half years ago, where in yellow, you can see long COVID um, and you can barely see the, the hashed bars uh, of normal individuals which fall to the left of that. But in yellow, you see um, patients with two different algorithms, the long hauler index, which is on the uh, horizontal axis and the severity score on the vertical axis, which we were using for acute COVID at the time. Uh, yellow is long COVID, uh, blue is uh, MECFS, uh, and red is individuals with long COVID symptoms uh, following vaccination. Next slide. Uh, our hypothesis is that the SARS-CoV-2 S1 protein persists and long-lived uh, monocyte subsets, which really came out of my HIV work uh, over 25 years ago. Uh, similarly, peptidoglycan, we found a major component of the Borrelia burgdorferi cell uh, envelope in Lyme not only persists, but may be disseminated by the same monocytic subsets, um, similar to the mechanisms that we discovered in long COVID. And that particular subset is the non-classical uh, monocytes, which their sole role is to patrol blood vessels and bind to blood vessels through the fractalkine, fractalkine receptor pathway. And again, um, Iwasaki's group uh, corroborated this work in their paper by showing increases in non-classical uh, monocytes, which we think is at the heart of the endotheliitis that we first described over two years ago. Next slide. Again, this is a um, flow cytometry diagram of the assay that's now commercially available in the United States uh, and in the EU. Um, in blue are um, S1 uh, carrying monocytes in the uh, non-classical monocyte subpopulation. In red are uh, S1 containing intermediate monocytes um, you know, that are also carrying the S1 protein. We showed with HIV um, that these two subsets were infectable by HIV, and in fact, um, they have been implicated in carrying Zika, dengue fever, and other viruses uh, through the blood-brain barrier, uh, and like I said, causing um, uh, vascular inflammation. Next slide. Now, what's really important is not only did we find uh, S1 protein 15 months after um, infection. We also found fragments of RNA uh, 15 months after infection. So we were first to show the persistence of SARS-CoV-2 uh, in individuals with long COVID. We then asked the big question, I think that's still uh, a matter of definition between persistence 
and viral um, uh, replication competence. And we address this by doing uh, full genome sequencing, both in monocytes and in tissues, to show that there is less than 5% of the SARS-CoV-2 genome, despite the fact that RNA is detectable at 15 months, with less than 5% of the genome, it's hard to imagine um, a virus being replication competent. Next slide. This is a really important paper we wrote in 2020. Uh, in this, we actually showed treatment with CCR5 antagonists for acute COVID. Um, and in panel B over in the lower left, the, the levels of CD8 T cells were uh, in the single digits when they should be around 25 to 30%, they were five to 15%. Um, not only were the CD8 T cells low in number, um, but they were um, exhausted and expressed low levels of, of um, granzyme A. Um, next slide. That led us to really define, because we were seeing this uh, uh, reactivation of the chronic herpes viruses because of the low CD8 count, uh, develop an algorithm that allowed us to separate MECFS, PASC, post-vaccination patients with long haulers, Lyme, and severe and acute um, uh, COVID. And I think this algorithm, this is the first uh, test case of the algorithm. We've now gone on with uh, hundreds of MECFS, hundreds of Lyme patients to validate um, this algorithm. And we use it clinically to say whether or not your pure long COVID MECFS uh, or post Lyme. And we've used this algorithm. We've identified 50 patients in the last two months who had Lyme who never knew it. And, and again, I think uh, the trial by Duke, uh, they were savvy by um, excluding patients with Lyme who very much mimic uh, long COVID. Next slide. And again, we used a confusion matrix over on the left to show that we had over 90% accuracy in detecting uh, long COVID in the mix of, um, of post uh, Lyme and MECFS, which is a critically important. Um, and also acute COVID as we see patients now on their third and fourth cycle uh, of acute COVID amongst uh, the long haulers. On the right is a new report that we're gonna be generating during telemedicine that uses a, a new algorithm to decide whether or not you have um, long COVID, uh, post Lyme, MECFS, uh, or acute COVID uh, based on the cytokine signatures that you see over on the left uh, in the confusion matrix. Dr. Pettifin, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press to uh, try to wrap up very soon. We're, we're cutting into the last panel of the day, and we've got one more speaker. So, um, I, I could implore you, that would be great. No, can you go then keep going forward to the um, our clinical trial? Go forward, forward, forward. Okay, so one more. So this is the paper that just came out, which showed the, um, the effects of Maraviroc and Prevostatin on patients with long COVID and the decrease in um, not only the chronic inflammatory markers, but also in the symptom scores and the correlation of specific inflammatory markers with symptom scores, all statistically significant. And if you go to the prior slide, previous slide, this is the symptom scores where we used, um, looked at dyspnea, fatigue, um, cardiac, neuro, and dysautonomia, the COMPASS 31, and showed all of those were decreased by the combination of Maraviroc and Prevostatin over six to 12 weeks, um, uh, statistically significantly. Uh, and in the next slide, as I showed you, we, we related that to specific cytokines. So now we can say, if you have this biomarker elevated, you should have this symptoms. And we find ourselves on telemedicine being able to predict that. Next slide. And this is the last slide. We extended that study to 314 patients to mimic our clinical trial, which will uh, start in June. 
Um, it'll be a 505B2 um, extension trial. Uh, and you can see that 314 patients pre and post Maraviroc and Prevastatin, the decrease in long hauler index, which is our um, algorithm for uh, assessing long COVID, uh, decreased with a p-value of 10 to the minus six. TNF-alpha, which is the major driver of fatigue, decreased 10 to the minus 12. CCL5 um, and SCD40L also decreased with statistical significance. Next slide. And I believe that's it. All this information is available on covidlonghaulers.com. Appreciate your time. And we look forward to um, starting our clinical trial in, um, in June and submitting our um, documentation by uh, early April. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Patterson. And of course, we wish you the best of, best of luck and look forward to seeing the outcome of your upcoming clinical trial. Uh, our final presentation today, um, before we have our final panel, uh, is by Dr. Seth uh, Letterman, uh, CEO of Tonics Pharmaceuticals. So Dr. Letterman, take it away, and then we'll move to our final panel. Thank you very much. What a great event. I'm so pleased to be included in this, and it gives me such hope that so many people are doing so many interesting things with long COVID. So I'm the CEO of Tonics Pharmaceuticals, and next slide. And like many of the other companies, we're a public company on NASDAQ, and I'll be be making forward-looking statements. Next slide. And uh, many people have talked about the role of infection and recovery from infection in possibly being related to the onset of long COVID. And as a number of people have uh, mentioned, uh, whatever word you use, um, uh, Admiral Levine used infection, associated chronic illnesses, um, fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, uh, CFS ME are certainly examples of those. Um, so I'm a rheumatologist. I was a professor at Columbia for 20 years in medicine and rheumatology. So I have a bias in, in focusing on fibromyalgia. Um, and we um, uh, I took note that when uh, the second bullet here, uh, Dan Claw from University of Michigan and some colleagues in August of 2020, predicted that there would be an epidemic of chronic pain following the COVID epidemic. And that was very much along with my thinking, he's an expert in fibromyalgia. And then similarly, as I think everyone, all the panelists know that in August of 22, when the National Research Action Plan was published, um, it endorsed the connection between long COVID and chronic fatigue syndrome. Next slide, please. So, Fibromyalgia is mostly thought of in the lens of central sensitization, meaning that the uh, some part in the brain is um, amplifies experiences of all five senses. Most people focus on pain, but um, central sensitization, I think, is a good term. And here's a, on the left is a panel of a, a cohort of long COVID patients assessed for uh, central sensitization, showing about two thirds of long COVID patients have this characteristic um, uh, phenomenon that you normally see in fibromyalgia. On the right is a very recent study just came out showing a comparable amount of pain, fatigue, and function between uh, long COVID essentially, fibromyalgia, and CFSME. Next slide. So I think of fibromyalgia as having four main symptoms. Multi-site pain, meaning pain all over the body, memory issues, which many people refer to as brain fog, fatigue, which is low energy, and sleep problems. And it's striking to me that a number of people um, with long COVID have these same features. And uh, this ties into a new conception of pain that Dan Claw and others have, have um, uh, begun to build on and endorse where there are three types of pain and nociceptive pain is the new word, the new term for central sensitization. Uh, the other two types of pain are the more common ones. I'm sorry, nociceptive pain is like stubbing your toe. Nociplastic pain is the, um, is the term for this spectrum of multi-site pain, memory issues, fatigue, and sleep disturbance. And neuropathic pain is the, the common uh, term for 
uh, neuropathic pain when there's a nerve injury. Uh, next slide. So we've focused on the idea that there's a subset of long COVID that we consider to be fibromyalgia like long COVID. And we are developing this product, TNX102SL, as a uh, bedtime sublingual cyclobenzaprine preparation to treat fibromyalgia. We're mid phase three, we have one positive phase three study under our belt, and we are uh, more than halfway enrolled in a confirmatory potential pivotal phase three study for fibromyalgia. So we've taken our hypothesis about the overlap of fibromyalgia and long COVID um, to the point of testing this product that's been effective in one study, one phase three study of fibromyalgia into long COVID. And that study is uh, uh, shown in a schematic on the next slide. And this is my last slide, but this is the study. It's a phase two study in, in long COVID. We call it the PREVAIL study. It's a parallel design, double blind, randomized placebo controlled study. And we're currently enrolling patients now. It's 14 weeks. After two weeks, there's a, uh, a forced uh, titration to the full dose of 5.6 milligrams. And I just want to um, explain on this slide that this is uh, a different approach than the others on this uh, panel have taken because our, our approach is to use the fibromyalgia paradigm to use the same endpoints that the FDA accepts for fibromyalgia as a test for the efficacy of this program in fibromyalgia type long COVID. So the primary endpoint of this study is the change in the uh, daily pain score uh, measured weekly over uh, the 12 weeks at the full dose. So we think that this is a way to uh, address a segment of long COVID, and that's been emphasized by a number of people, that there are subtypes of this heterogeneous disease. Um, but to, to address this one subset, which may be as many as two thirds of patients who have fibromyalgia type long COVID, to use endpoints that FDA already recognizes valid for fibromyalgia, and to see if this um, uh, drug treatment uh, will have similar effects in long COVID of fibromyalgia type long COVID as it has in fibromyalgia. So with that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you again to the organizers for including us in this program. And it's very exciting to be a participant. Thank you so much, Dr. Letterman. Uh, and now for our last uh, part of the last part of our event today, we're gonna have a panel conversation with Dr. Julie Gervadine, CEO of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health and Dr. Chris Austin, CEO and partner at Flagship Pioneering, both of whom I, I've been lucky enough to have collaborated with over the years. Uh, my co-host, uh, Ovid Emete, will moderate this discussion. So over to you, Ovid. Thank you very much, Carla. This was, uh, this was a great, uh, uh, great session. Um, Julian, Chris, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, your careers span the entire R&D ecosystem. So I, I, I personally, I find it to be really a special treat to reflect on your experiences. and. Uh, and discuss what we can do now to accelerate therapeutic progress uh, in long COVID and those other overlapping infection associated diseases that, uh, that we heard about today. Um, so maybe Chris, to start uh, with you, you were the founding director uh, of the National Center for Advancing Translational Science uh, at the NIH. Um, and this is pretty much where we are now with, with long COVID. So what do you see is needed uh, to advance translational studies in long COVID uh, so we can actually accelerate therapeutic progress. It's great to be here, and it's great to be here, especially with you, Ovid, and, and, and Julie, your old friend. And um, I'm going to speak both from my perspective of about 20 years at the NIH uh, running, running NCATS, uh, and then my more recent experience at Flagship and running a company focused on common diseases, which actually has a lot in common with what we've been talking about today. And, and I'll just give you a few thoughts, and then I'm going to get to what, what, what I think we need to do from an industry perspective. Uh, <clears throat> there, there are many, many conditions that are quietly affecting 
millions of people that are particularly difficult or unattractive for industry to address. And long COVID is the latest edition of that long list. But, but there are many other common chronic disorders, whether we want to think about chronic kidney disease or congestive heart failure or schizophrenia or Alzheimer's disease, on and on and on, which have a lot of the same kinds of, uh, kinds of uh, properties that we've been talking about these. And, and one of the reasons that industry has shied away from developing uh, drugs for common diseases, these silent epidemics, if you will, is that the translation of the, the, the classic tra uh, traditional uh, drug development paradigm just doesn't work very well. And, and we've, we've heard this over and over again today, something that is one of the bases of the company of the same. We've, already, we've always started with a diagnosis as the ground truth. Uh, and, and, and you've seen today, and it's the case with lots of other common diseases, that a diagnosis is not the same thing as a disease. Uh, and this is particularly evident in long COVID. We have a myriad of symptoms and clinical phenotypes, all of which are under this, this umbrella diagnosis. And, and this is something I've worked on my entire career, uh, including my work at NIH uh, during the peak of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, and now at Vesalius, focusing on common disease. And it's, it, we're, what we're doing in common diseases is what we're finding is so necessary in COVID, long COVID, that, that throws out the conventional wisdom that the diagnosis is the be all and end all. And we need to focus on what patients actually have, what their clinical symptoms actually have, and that that matches much more cleanly to mechanism, which is of course what we need to have in order to make an effective drug. So we, we know that we already have the tools to do this. And you've seen some of this today to, to, serend to, to systematically, not the traditional way drug I've always drawn to drug development for much of my career, which is which is hoping for serendipity. That instead of that, uh, to, to to do this systematically and and run really efficient trials that are focused on the clinical uh, symptoms that people have, an understanding of a disease, not a not a broad diagnosis. So so how do we do this in COVID in long COVID? <clears throat> well, I do think that we can learn a lot from Operation Warp Speed. I mean that was a remarkable effort, and, and I saw it from the inside at, at the NIH, uh, and, and we need to think of it, it much like we did in, in, in the active collaborative and other aspects of, of Operation Warp Speed, thinking about drug development in a fundamentally different way that, that could get treatments to patients, not in 12 to 15 years, the usual time it takes, but, but in, in a couple of years. And, and I actually think that's possible, and we've shown that it's possible in, uh, in, in uh, in, in, in the original COVID. And it's, but it has been striking to me <clears throat> from the outside to, to see how different the, the societal approach to long COVID has been compared to COVID itself. This is, COVID was an all hand on deck uh, uh, um, experience for all of us for all the reasons that we know. And, it, and certainly uh, long COVID came or, or the, the uh, uh, Operation Warp Speed and the original COVID, acute COVID, came with a lot of funding. And don't get me wrong, funding is incredibly important, but we shouldn't overlook all of the non-funding uh, issues that, uh, th that really made this work. The, the FDA coordination that was so central to, uh, to getting these, these uh, diagnostics and therapeutics and vaccines developed, the collaboration across different parts of the NIH, there's 27 different institutes at the NIH, and they all work together. Uh, to, to make things happen. A very close collaboration with the Foundation for NIH, the active initiative that involved uh, dozens of companies as well, and, and company to company uh, collaborations. Most one that really comes to mind is an industry collaborative that Andy Plump at, at Takeda set up. And, and we haven't seen that for a variety of reasons so far. I mean, there's a lot of wonderful individual efforts and we've heard about some today, but, but not the not the, uh, the the really coordinated effort that I think we need to see. So, so what can federal agencies do in this? And 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 uh, they can do a lot. And and I would say for those who are have not been in industry before, you may uh, be surprised that that federal agencies can send an absolutely pivotal uh, message to the private sector uh, with the right signals that whether they should invest in uh, certain areas uh, or not. Uh, 
and, and they send those signals by whether they choose to, inter to interact with industry or not. And if the pathway is unclear, uh, uh, then private industry won't be able to justify uh, the investment. Uh, government policy certainly uh, bears directly on this question and, 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 and can, can um, influence individual company decisions. I'll just make two other points. One, one is that, that COVID, I think long COVID, is, is an enormous uh, societal and medical burden, but we shouldn't overlap, we, we shouldn't overlook how much we can learn from long COVID about the many components of these <coughs> disease that we've seen today, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, immunological disease, uh, that, 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 that it's not just long COVID that would benefit from this, many other diseases uh, as well. Uh, so we, we, we have to think, I think, we have to think about long COVID as a part of the COVID response, the federal response, not an afterthought. And the White House has been highlighting this as a priority, which is a great start. But the proof of that now will be in, in how government agencies, uh, uh, and you've heard some of them today, uh, organizes itself and, and, uh, and, and works with industry in a really seamless way that was so successful during, during acute COVID. Thank you, Chris. Very, very, very helpful. And uh, Julie, you, you faced emergencies before when you were at the CDC, and then you were able to bring the patient needs to, uh, to big pharma, um, and now at the, at the FNIH. Uh, how, do you, how do you see that? What, uh, what, what can we do, and uh, how can we uh, implement some of, of Chris's recommendations of really pulling together? You know, first of all, I agree with everything Chris said, but I do think that it's human nature to um, argue against a chronic emergency. And so it is very difficult to sustain urgency once the real palpable crisis is passed. And I think we're all anxious that we've been too quick to try and put COVID in the rear view mirror. And we have to take care that long COVID doesn't end up in that, that place. So. Um, I, I think the importance of sustaining urgency and really um, expecting that society may not be there, but we as scientists and as thought leaders have to maintain our focus on this very, very important condition or set of conditions that remain somewhat mysterious, even though it was encouraging to see some of the enlightenment that came forward in the presentations today. I think, you know, this is a really hard problem to solve, and it's a great example where the market approach alone is not going to be successful. Government alone can't do this. But when we come together and really learn some of the lessons that we learn in the crisis of COVID and try to apply them these private public partnership models, I think that's the only way we're going to really be able to move this forward. And that's partnership, not just with industry and government, but it also is partnership across government, you know, making sure that the NIH and the FDA are in lockstep, that our federal agencies are prepared to look at the end-to-end -end requirement for moving uh, potential therapeutics or diagnostics or even biomarkers through the um, evolutionary phase of development and approval. Because, you know, we're, we, we can't afford to, to misstep here. We really need to keep our eye on the prize. And that prize is something that a whole lot of people are struggling and waiting for us to find. So it's important to maintain the urgency. It's important to have the partnership model be as effective as it was during the crisis of acute COVID. But I think that also is incumbent upon those of us who sort of sit in the intersection of that space to do what we can to to build and maintain those effective relationships and to speak up when we see that there's an opportunity for improvement. So Julie, what, what do you see as opportunities? And uh, I think Chris highlighted some of other you know, areas, disease areas that, that could benefit from this. Um, so what, what are the opportunities that you see? How can we uh, make others aware of, uh, of, of those opportunities to collaborate and, and move things uh, forward? Yes, and I'm apologizing for the fact that the sun has come out in my neighborhood in the middle of this presentation, so I'm struggling to stay out of the out of the glare. Um, you know, I think uh, if you look at the broad field of infectious disease in my career, you know, I've certainly experienced um, the 
post-influenza fatigue syndrome. My husband suffered from the post-West Nile fatigue syndrome for several weeks to months. I think we have to begin to recognize that there is something about acute systemic infections that results in a set of aberrancies that um, for whatever reason have an, a longer term impact than you know the acute infection would necessarily predict. We've seen that with Zika, we've seen that with, with many of the emerging infectious diseases. So approaching this as a fundamental biologic problem that needs to be solved is the first step. And I really admire what Recover is doing to really try to do a thorough job of assessing all of the potential determinants and understanding the very basic biology. I know that's frustrating to people because we want to also uh, develop interventions to help the people who are affected. But in the long run, we'll learn a lot that I hope would be applicable to some of these other post-infectious syndromes that are uh, more prevalent than we probably ever really looked at systematically across a range of, of acute infections. But much to be learned, but I think we now have tools that should help us be able to do that more expeditiously than I could have even imagined 10 years ago when this first was crossing my plate. And, and I think that, you know, some of the areas that could contribute uh, really come from uh, oncology, where there's a lot of progress on understanding the immune system. And I know that the FNIH was uh, was supporting some of those cross-industry uh, initiatives, so maybe we can we can implement some of that. Uh, but uh, Chris, maybe I'll turn to you, uh, I, I think we're approaching the end of our, our time, so I will already... Uh, um, I invite you to our uh, next uh, next event, hopefully in person in Boston for the uh, uh, the biannual meeting. Uh, I can already see that we have some other uh, uh, stakeholders that we need to have at the table, such as the the regulators uh, and many uh, many others. Uh, but Chris, maybe if you could uh, offer some uh, uh, some uh, closing thoughts, and then uh, Carter will uh, I'll give it back to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm struck by two things that I would I would leave with everybody. One is that I think there's a real scientific opportunity here, given the fact that unlike most common chronic diseases, we know when the outset was of this, of this disorder. Most of the time, we don't know when an illness, an illness of multiple organ systems happens. And so this is a, we, we need to not only think about this as the important syndrome that it is, group of syndromes, long, long COVID, but it's an opportunity, it's a unique, awful, awful, but unique opportunity to, to do studies in long COVID that I think will benefit many, many, many other diseases. The, the second is that something that I saw uh, when we think about opportunity, something that I saw in, <clears throat> in the acute response was something that we all realized at the time, and I think we all realize hypothetically, but we tend to forget it conveniently, is, is that when we work together, we all benefit. We tend to think as human beings that, that if I give something, it's, it, it's, a, it's a zero sum game. But what we, what we discovered was it is not a zero sum game. If we work the way we did in, in the acute COVID response, one plus one really does equal three and everybody benefits. And, and, and I think that attitude, if we put that together with the fact that we can learn so much from this disorder, not only for the patients who have COVID, but for a lot of long COVID, but for a lot of other diseases, there's an enormous opportunity there. Thank you very much, uh, Julie. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, I look forward to continuing this conversation, hopefully uh, in person next time. Uh, Carter, uh, please, if you could uh, um, uh, bring us to the uh, the end of this uh, this wonderful afternoon. Yes, I was I was succinctly bring us home so everybody can I get stay, stay on, the, on their schedules and. And thank you all for spending so much time with us today on this very important topic. Uh, and Chris and Julie, you know, again, I think you just really brought some clarity to the discussions we've been having all day. And, and while it's a challenge, I think, you know, I've been with the biotech industry for the better part of 15 years and, and challenges is, is where scientists and, and uh, developers of, of medicines and diagnostics thrive. So I think we're, we're ready to ready for the challenge um, and, and hopefully we will be able to benefit um, patients that are suffering today. Um, so again, what a great afternoon of learning and inspiration. It's clear that one, long COVID is real. Two, we are making progress in understanding the disease, but more work needs to be done. And three, there's some momentum uh, in research and diagnostic um, and therapeutic development that we need to continue to uh, foster. Um, 
and expand. Patients are waiting, so we must work, as Chris just said, collaboratively. We need to support funding for basic research. We need to ensure that we're incentivizing diagnostic and therapeutic research and development, and that we gain clarity, that we work with our partners on, on regulate, our, our, our partnered regulators to ensure that we're gaining clarity about how to effectively and efficiently navigate through regulatory processes necessary to provide um, new therapeutics and diagnostics to the patients that need them. We will, Bio and uh, uh, Solve will continue to inform you about our long COVID activities, uh, including, uh, as Ovid mentioned, uh, an in-person event that we're planning during Bio's uh, international convention um, meetings in Boston uh, this June. And, and Ovid, thank you so much for this partnership. Thank you to all the presenters and participants, and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. So thank you again, have a great evening.